Welcome to another cross-border talk where we point our attention to a very curious uh, case in Romania uh, of a golden mine project which uh, uh, gathered a lot of passions over the years and it was at some moment the protest for this golden mine projects were called uh, protest of a generation or the political project of a generation uh, so this is the Russia Montana uh, gold mine project and uh, just recently in, in this month uh, March of 2024 um, an arbitrage uh, court uh, uh, in the USA decided that uh, Romanian state does not have to pay compensation for the fact that it basically stopped the implementation of the concession for golden uh, mining in Russia Montana Today we are going to speak with a person who is very much admired by all the activists of Russia Montana uh, protests. Uh, this is Stephanie Roth, a Swiss French uh, journalist and ecological activist who has been involved with uh, the Russia Montana movement since 2002. And she has been involved uh, very much in the strategy and tactics of this uh, movement. Um, Stephanie, uh, we are glad to have you here, and I pass now the word to my colleague Malgujata, who asked the first question. Yeah, and before the first question is asked, I would like to say thank again you thank you me. to Stephanie for being with us. And uh, yeah, and I would like to ask about your first reaction, a very spontaneous first reaction when you heard what the arbitration court decided, that there is no compensation, we will be paid by Romania. What did you, how did you feel? What did you think? Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody, and, and thank you for having me here today. So that moment um, when we heard the, the result, um, there was a huge relief, um, an incredible relief. I mean, it was so heavy, uh, what was on our sh shoulder. Um, just days, uh, hours before the verdict was announced, uh, the Romanian media and, and the Romanian state um, had, uh, were continuing a propaganda campaign that they started on 1st of February, saying that Romania would lose the case uh, and that Romania might have to pay $6.7 million uh, compensation. And it was a very aggressive campaign uh, organized by the Romanian state. Um, who is getting going into an election campaign. And they were, of course, pointing the finger at us um, and saying that the activists um, are guilty and the activists should pay. Um, and they were pointing it at the UNESCO nomination of 2001. This is when Rocha Montana was nominated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And they said that the politicians who supported this were corrupt and bad. And so that was the just to, for you to understand the, the con context um, uh, in the in the in the in the weeks um, or in the hours up to the award so there was a huge relief um, but it's a bittersweet um, it's a bittersweet decision for us because you know for eight years we have been fighting uh, in in the courts in the arbitration courts because we submitted three intervention uh, to the arbitration court they're called amicus curie um, and we submitted three of them and the court case lasted eight years and Romanian courts had previously already annulled the gold mine and the, the permitting procedure and now for eight years um, the suffering of the people of Rocha Montana continued until the private arbitration court uh, took a decision so of course we are very happy that Romania doesn't have to pay compensation but it's a bittersweet decision because Osha Montana wouldn't have had to wait for eight years to start living a normal life in dignity it was bittersweet relieved and bittersweet okay if we could now go back to the very beginning of this story what were the stakes what were the project, what did the mining project comprise when it was first presented and why it was so important to stop it? Um, uh, in April 2002, I, I visited for the first time um, 
Rocha Montana. Uh, I was back then, I was a journalist um, and I visited the place and I spoke to the locals, um, engineers, they had all worked in a nearby mine. So they were experts in mining and they showed me the mine. Um, it was a mine that was supposed to make the maximum profit uh, for the company. And the mine proposed um, to, you, to use huge, huge amounts of toxic cyanide to separate uh, the gold um, from the ore. Um, and if you remember in, uh, in 2002, and, and, and two, I think there was a huge accident in Romania at Bayamare um, where cyanide spilled into the environment um, and it caused the death of tons and tons of fish and it decimated uh, the living income of fishermen um, and it polluted the Danube uh, into Hungary and into neighboring countries. And this had happened in Romania just a, a few years previously. And the company had declared bankruptcy and had left overnight. Experience, they don't have any mine anywhere else in the world. They just exist for Rocha Montana. They've never done a mine. So they wanted to build Europe's largest open cast gold mine in Rocha Montana with no experience. Um, and they wanted to use huge amounts of cyanide and from a technical point of view, in order to develop the mine, they needed to relocate the local population that lives there. And this population are, are farmers and they were given their lands um, and they go from, from their lands, they get a much more stable income than working in a company. So they wanted to stay and work their lands. They didn't want to leave. And, um, the government ab abandoned them and, and wanted Gabriel to, to expropriate them. And that was, I think, a very high price to pay. And also, in order to make the mine, they would have had to cut down all the trees. There are lots of forests around Rocha Montana. They would have had to cut down all the forests. They wanted to deviate two rivers, and that is against the EU Water Framework Directive. And, and also, um, Gold has been mined in Rocha Montana since the Roman times, and, and um, the, the, they left a lot of archaeological heritage behind that is quite unique in the world. We have um, kilometers of tunnels uh, in the mountains that date from Roman times, and we also have uh, temples um, and funeral places that uh, date from Roman times. And um, they would have had destroyed all that because the gold lay exactly where the people live and where you have the archaeological artifacts and also where you have the river and the nature. Um, and they would have had to take all of that away to create huge craters, you know, several kilometers wide and several kilometers deep. Um, and they wanted to excavate 13 million tons of rock uh, per year. And that is a huge amount, 13 million tons, you know, that's, I don't know how many elephants it would be, I don't know, millions of elephants. Um, and they wanted to use cyanide um, every day. And they wanted to use huge amounts of cyanide. Um, and these are very risky. And um, yeah, and so that seemed a very high price to pay. Um, and so that is why it was so important to stop the project for the people, for the nature. Um, and for the heritage and against greed. Yeah, you said against greed. And uh, we know that the project, the, the, the project was stopped because of the mass protest that happened. That we will, Vladimir will ask you about their strategy and tactics in a moment. But I would like to mark one fact. If there were protests then it means that the project actually had supporters in Romanian political elite of that time. So if the project was so, if the whole mining project was so detrimental to uh, to the to nature, also to historical heritage of Romania, why anybody would like to endorse it? What is your point on that? So well, first of all, you know, Romania is known for its corruption. Um, and I would argue that this was also the case in Rocha Montana. So, for example, in 2010, the Ministry of Culture 
uh, made a, a deal, a contract with Gable Resources, um, and they wanted to have $70 million from Gabriel Resources, the Romanian Ministry of Culture, and in return for the $70 million, they would give them all the permits for Rocha Montana that otherwise, under law, they were not able to get. Okay, so this is the first thing. The second thing is that um, in Rocha Montana, we had a company called Rocha Montana Gold Corporation, and Rocha Montana Gold Corporation is a joint venture between the Romanian state, owning just a little under 20%, and Gable Resources, owning the, the rest. And so what happens many times when mining companies come into a country and they want to build a big project and they know that there's likely going to be some shit hitting their fan, what they tend to do, they tend to make a joint venture with a government because then the government gets all the permits for them and all the things and they hope that they can keep everything under the lid so that people don't hear about the mine right and they try to do everything under the table quickly between the state and the company and then and only once the mine is green lighted then they tell the people but then it's too late right and this was also the case in Rocha Montana there was a lot of corruption right and it was this joint venture and the, the the joint venture meant that the romanian government declared gable resources as a strategic partner and that's why every authority automatically put the stamp on every permit without thinking that is how it happened okay um what uh, you did and your team or your co um, cooperators co colleagues did um, uh was a wide-ranging campaign uh i want you to present us something more about uh, the tactics and the strategy of the campaign which you consulted and uh, in what ways uh, it was successful what were the successes or the great realizations of this campaign yeah, so the, thank you for the question so the 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 campaign to save Russia montana has always been the largest campaign in romania ever since 2002 and this is because before it nothing much existed in terms of protests or campaigns right so throughout the time it was always big this has now changed since there were Rocha montana was the revolution of our time and it inspired a lot of young people and elderly people in romania and now they tend to go much more often into the streets and start big demonstrations but until Rocha montana that was not the case and so Rocha Montana organized many actions and many demonstrations from 2002 to 2013, and they were always the biggest of their time. So how did it all start? Very simple. Um, I, I moved to Rocha Montana in 2002 um, because uh, local farmers asked me to come and help with their campaign because they were, were busy looking after their lands and they couldn't sit in, in front of a computer and check the share price and do strategies. And so I moved to Russia in 2002 and I was very lucky because I met a lovely girl there called Stefania. She was a student from Cluj and she always also wanted to come and help. And so we both moved into a house in Russia Montana and we started to strategize. So it goes like this at the beginning there was nothing apart from the local opposition and so we had to build sort of like we had to increase our partnership our strategic reach and so we had to find strategic partners so the problems of the project of gable resources were environmental the cyanide and the destruction of the forest they were social because of the forced relocation of the people right they were uh, economic because the true cost of the mine is a loss for Romania and not a gain, right? They were heritage because of the destruction of uh, the cultural patrimony of Rocha Montana. Um, and what was the other one? Uh, social, environmental, cultural and economic. Yeah, those were the big problems. And so we started by building partnerships with experts in all of these things. Okay, so for the environment, we approached Greenpeace, 
uh, Greenpeace Central Eastern Europe. And so Greenpeace Central Eastern Europe in 2002 made a visit to Rocha Montana and they became one of our closest bodies and friends. Um, and they are also our partners now in the court case at the Washington Tribunal. Okay, so that was the environmental side. And then uh, we looked at the archeological or cultural side. So we went to Hungary um, where they have ICOMOS um, because ICOMOS Romania was not that strong at that time or we didn't know them. So we went to ICOMOS in, in Hungary. <coughs> but luckily also, there were also some amazing archeologists in the city of Cluj uh, and professors such as Mr. Pizzo and others. And um, they were also against the project. And so they also helped us. They also joined our campaign. Um, and then for the economic thing, we went to the uh, University Aze in Bucharest. Um, and we made, we made partnership with Aze, who is very strong on economics. And then they made assessments on the true cost of the mine. And so this is how we then built the arguments and we built the case uh, for Rocha Montana so that people could understand the different problems. You know, as citizens, we don't sort of like think only in one way. We, only th we don't think in silos. We have many things that we think about. So we wanted to really build an argument that, that everybody could understand whether you are interested in the environment, in culture, in all of it together, etc. And then we created a website. And then we started with uh, making requests of access to information uh, to the local town hall in Rocha Montana. We wanted to have access to all the documents, to the contracts, so all the things that had happened so that we could understand better the case. And in those days, um, you know, uh, Romania didn't like to give you access to documents. So many times we still had to go to court um, to be given access uh, to those documents. But I was we were incredibly lucky. And that was that lady who had moved in with me, Stefania Simeon, is a legal genius there is no one as smart as she is and so stefania started our sort of like legal division um, and she was the one in charge um, that uh, took care of all these legal aspects and so what happened is that we started uh, protests uh, on the streets in bucharest etc and after some time we realized that the government was patting us on the shoulder and was saying, oh yeah, thank you so much for coming, but actually, goodbye. And so we saw that we didn't have any, there was no change, right? And so we saw that we have to do other things. And so we started to sue the Romanian government. Permit after permit that they issued, this was the largest gold mine in Europe that they wanted to develop. And so you can imagine that you need a lot of permits not only environmental permit, you need archaeological permit, electricity permit, water permit, all the permits in the world. And when the authorities who were as corrupt with Gabriel put the stamps on all the permits, my friend Stefania took them to court and sued them. And she was very good and she annulled all the permits. And that was the biggest problem for Gabriel Resources because they wanted to start to mine the gold in 2003. And by 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, no bloody gold. And that was because we stopped them in the courts. Or oh, my friend, Stefania, did all that work. She was very successful and she managed to stop Gable Resources or RMGC, Rocha Montana Gold Corporation, in the courts. And at the same time, we continued to make protests. We went to the Canadian embassy because Canada, you know, Canadian mining company, we did all kinds of things. But, you know, um, there was huge political pressure because this was going to become the largest mine in Europe. There was a huge amount of money. The Gable Resources was pressuring the government. You know, the, the Canadian ambassador uh, was pressuring uh, the government, was going in and out of government meeting and was yelling and was saying that if we don't get the mine in Romania, then Canada will walk away from Romania. You know, threatening with diplomatic outrages and think, I mean, you, it, wow. And so in 2000 and 10, 11, um, when the environmental impact assessment procedure was ongoing, um, Gable Resources went to the Romanian government and said, okay, we want to bloody mine and you have to get your ass in gear and 
the Romanian government said, well, we're sorry, we can't give you the permit for the mine because your project is against the EU um, water framework directive. And it is also against several Romanian heritage laws. And we can't expropriate people for a commercial project. And so they decided to declare the project of overriding national interest. Because when you declare something of over national, overriding national interest, just as is the case with your autobahn, you know, then you don't need any environmental permits. You can just do it. And in 2013, Victor Ponto, the prime minister of the time, um, put out uh, a draft bill uh, that was to declare Rocha Montana of national interest and hence could expropriate the local people, they could destroy the archaeological heritage, and they could circumvene uh, the EU Water Framework Directive. And this is when the people took to the streets, because it was a law that was only made for one company, Gable Resources. And you make laws either for everybody or for no one. And so that upset the people a lot, uh, and they took to the streets. And also many people had come to Rocha Montana since um, 2014 uh, and earlier, uh, since sorry, since 2004, time goes so 10 years are very fast because each year we would organize a huge music festival, uh, an event at Rocha Montana called Fun Fest, for young people to come to Rocha Montana and see this beautiful place. And so hundreds and thousands of people came and saw that beautiful place and fell in love with it. And when in 2013 the special law was proposed. They took to the streets and they came out to defend their friends in Rocha Montana and defend the place that they loved so much from coming here in the summer. And that is a very long story. I'm sorry. There you go. <laughs> um, it was really amazing uh, when in 2013 a coalition of very different type of people gathered to protest in the name of Rocha Montana. So you had uh, civic type of people, you had ecologists. I dare say you have even patriots, Romanian nationalists, if you wish, who were somehow skeptical of foreign capital. Uh, and they were really, uh, it, they were really the protests of a generation, as they say. And uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the party which later appeared called Union Save Romania also was born uh, as some kind of a follow up of these protests because during these protests people were gathering and discussing and looking for some uh, change let's say so i want to ask you also about that uh, how do you appreciate uh, the heritage of russia montana protests over the last 10 years uh, what is in fact this heritage what did the russia protest russia montana protest change for romania well i, I feel I feel very uneasy uh, to answer that question because I'm not Romanian. Um, and I guess only a Romanian could tell you how important the protests have been for them. But I can tell you as a campaigner and as a woman and as a person who lived for 10 years in Rocha Montana at a time when realities there was a war, because you have to imagine that the company tried to make everybody leave and they put brother against brother and sister against sister so that they can get their lands and things like that. And it was a real war uh, that we lived in Rocha Montana. That's without any exaggeration. And I lived there for 10 years in those days. And I can tell you that as a woman and as a campaigner and as a person who lived with the locals of Rocha Montana for such a long time, right, the solidarity and the insistence and the stubbornness of people from so many wide sectors of Romania to come to the rescue or to come to support the fight of the local people is some the most beautiful moment in my life. You know, I mean, so I don't know. I mean, they are a huge inspiration for me. And um, if I was able to fight or to keep going after all that time until the verdict on last Friday, then it is because I can still see all these beautiful faces in front of me who believed in Rocha Montana and who were stubborn and who took risks and took to the streets and who united saved Rocha Montana. Okay. You mentioned that uh, these were very moving, uh, really emotional moments for you. And I want to uh, finish our uh, episode on uh, Rocha Montana story, um, asking you about uh, 
what's next in your life of a campaigner, activist, fighter for change. You have been involved not only in Russia, Montana, but also in other uh, projects or fights in Romania. And also you have been TTIP uh, protester, if I may say, or coordinator even on a European level against the TTIP, this free trade agreement. So uh, I have the feeling you have in the blood uh, the instinct to fight for uh, social causes. What's now next for you, now that Russia Montana seems to be uh, behind? Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's a very, very nice question, yes. Um, so on a personal level, um, I always said uh, already when I was young um, that I want to move to Russia and I want to go get old there. And I want all my friends uh, to be able to, I want to find a home there. And then I want all my friends and everybody who ever helped Russia Montana, if they need a home, that this would be their home too. And so this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to find a house in Russia Montana because hopefully there will be lots of houses for sale um, now that the project has been abandoned and I will buy a house uh, and maybe another one next door to it uh, and I will open it to campaigners and to friends um, who need moments of resting, who need good friends or who need shelter. Um, and I want to live in Rocha Montana until the end of my days, and which I hope will be still many years ahead. And then in the meantime, I would like to rebuild Rocha Montana because Gable Resources depopulated the area and they bought lots of houses, uh, which are monuments, but they let them degrade. And so now we want to restore Rocha Montana and we want to make the place accessible for lots of tourists to come. Rocha Montana today is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And so hopefully this will bring a lot of guests. And I think that it's the heritage and the people and the nature that are the true gold of Russia Montana. And I hope that a lot of people will come, including you, and visit us. And if you wait until I have a house, uh, you will have a bed, you will have a table, you will have to eat. Um, Yes, and we shall live and celebrate life. Um, And if there are any fights uh, in the meantime, that are worth fighting. And if I still have energy in me, then I will also try and support any other fight that needs help. That's how I see, that's my vision. That's a beautiful message of solidarity and praise of life that I am really happy that we are having, that we will be having these words on Cross Border Talks podcasts. I wish you indeed many years in Russia, Montana, in Romania. I wish you to see Russia, Montana, flower again. I wish you to see everything that is beautiful and though it was destroyed to be restored and to be seen by people from all around the world. And I am sure that among these visitors, there will be also me and Vladimir on one day. So wonderful. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you to everybody who listened to this cross-border talk. I just remind you at this point that cross-border talks are to be seen and heard on both YouTube and SoundCloud, Spotify and other social platforms. And you can also subscribe to our website directly so that you never miss a new publications. Stephanie wrote an activist who helped to save Russia Montana and who helped to organize one of the biggest examples of solidarity in Romania and in the Balkan region of last decades, was our guest today. Thank you very much and see you again.